Good morning, good afternoon, depending on which side of the Queensland border you are at the moment. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to have such a timely discussion balancing human rights during COVID-19. This is a live panel discussion and I am on Darug and Gundungurra country and I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I am sitting and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and welcome any Indigenous guests joining us today. And on behalf of all of the panel, can I pay respects to traditional custodians of land on all the lands on which we are sitting in our um, online formation today. The panel, the live panel discussion has a, a really wonderful group of speakers moderated, of course, by my excellent colleague, the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo. And joining Ed in this wonderful discussion, we have Professor Michael Kidd, AM, Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Professor Robin Quiggan, Associate Dean, Indigenous Leadership and Engagement at the University of Technology, Sydney. Hugh de Kretzer, Executive Director of the Human Rights Law Centre, and Professor Sarah Joseph, Professor of Human Rights Law at Griffith University. I won't introduce the panel other than that. I will leave those honours to my colleague, Ed Santo, and I will introduce Greg in a moment, uh, Greg Dickerson from LexisNexis. But I did want to say at the opening, this is a, an excellent time to be talking about human rights. I have been really struck this year by how rights talk has entered conversation on on a level that's almost unprecedented, I would suggest, since the Second World War. People are talking about rights, people are invoking their rights, even if somewhat misplaced, and invoking things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and other things. The fact that people are talking about rights, I think is a really refreshing moment to open up again, and in a wider way, the possibilities of human rights and human rights thinking to enable us to calibrate the responses in a transparent and accountable way, which is true to the preservation of life, but also true to the, the challenge of balancing rights in order to preserve dignity um, as well. So I would like now just to pass on to Greg Dickerson, from LexisNexis, who is going to make some opening, opening remarks, remarks before then handing on to Commissioner Santo. I'm, I'm delighted, Greg, that, that LexisNexis has sponsored this event because um, LexisNexis have also been long-term supporters of our Human Rights Awards. And this year, our Human Rights Heroes Celebration, which is this year's version of the Human Rights Awards, um, in the absence of being able to celebrate face to face in one longish lunch, we're going to have an even longer lunch <laughs> spread over three days of celebration of human rights hero heroes, which will spread from the 7th of December through to Human Rights Day on the 10th of December. And of course, on the 10th of December, we have, will have our human rights oration. And this year's speaker is Rosemary Caius, who was last year's human rights medalists. So Greg, I'm delighted to um, introduce you as um, um, that you lead LexisNexis's businesses in Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Islands with a focus on helping customers in the Pacific region to advance the practice of law through innovative information, technology and analytics solutions. I'm delighted to hand over to you with that brief introduction to provide some opening remarks and then for Commissioner Santo to take over the challenging and wonderful task of moderating such a fine group of panelists. So enjoy the, the opportunity to listen to our conversation today. And I'm sure that you will all take away with some wonderful morsels, continue to continue your own thinking about human rights and what we all can do to protect human rights for everyone, everywhere, every day. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Rosen. That, uh, great introduction. I will not take a long time because I'm very, very excited about this panel, very exciting panel, and I know Ed will be a brilliant moderator. Just on behalf of LexisNexis, 
um, we're very, very honoured and privileged to be, be able to sponsor this and to work as closely as we do with the Australian Human Rights Commission. You do incredible work and um, we are very, very proud to be associated with you. Uh, thinking about COVID in particular, often when you move fast, you break things, which is what the entrepreneurs talk about, you know, move fast and break things. But unfortunately, sometimes that means you can forget about the wider community and you can inadvertently break things, which may mean you overlook, overlook marginalised groups. And I'm very interested in this talk because I think that might be explored a bit. Um, for us, when COVID hit, we created a COVID information hub, which was all about getting as much free content up there to help people navigate the very quickly changing legal and regulatory environment. Um, and so what we try to do is get as much information out there. It's part of our tenant around the rule of law. And for us, we see the rule of law as being four basic and very strong pillars, equality under law, transparency of law, independent judiciary and accessible legal remedy and making sure that all four of those are equally treated. In particular for us as a legal data and content provider, transparency of law is, is the critical thing. We've done a lot of work in that space to make the law as transparent, as easily accessible as possible, um, including working very closely with the Australian Human Rights Commission on a human rights app, which lets people understand the human rights and that was recently trans translated into Vietnamese, which has been very exciting to be working with you. Um, just a little bit of work of talk about the rule of law. What we do is we actually have a separate foundation, a rule of law foundation. We've done quite a lot of work in the Pacific Islands about making the law as easily accessible as possible and consolidating the laws, especially in countries like Fiji, Nauru, the Cook Islands, Myanmar in, in Asia and the Maldives. Some of our employees actually managed to get to those islands. So they love our work in the rule of law, not just because of the, the, the the beauty of being able to work with such wonderful people, but also actually the beauty of the countries that they, that they are and, and being able to go there. I'm not going to say any more. I'm just very excited to see this and I'd like to hand over to Ed and I'm looking forward to an awesome session. Thank you so much, Greg, um, and to uh, Rosalind Cratcher, our president, for those introductory words. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, be moderating this discussion. Uh, Human rights has to be something more than words on a dusty page. And we're so fortunate today to have four uh, real experts um, in Australia and, and globally to discuss some of the human rights implications of COVID-19. I want to get straight into uh, hearing from them, but I'll, I'll just give you a bit more background to each of them. Starting with Professor Robin Quiggan, who is the Associate Dean Indigenous Leadership and Engagement at uh, UTS. Um, Robin was previously a much valued member of our commission, um, where she served uh, as Acting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commissioner in um, 2016. Uh, a member of the Wiradjuri Nation, Robin has developed an extraordinary reputation as an academic and in reform. Uh, we next have uh, Professor Michael Kidd, who is Australia's Deputy Chief Medical Officer. He's a former president of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and is one of our country's most decorated and eminent experts on public health. Uh, next, Sarah Joseph is Professor of Human Rights Law at Griffith University. Uh, for 15 years prior to that role, she led the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law. Sarah is one of Australia's leading and most respected human rights experts. And finally, but certainly not least, Hugh Kretzer is Executive Director of the Human Rights Law Centre. And uh, among many other um, eminent roles, he was previously a Commissioner of the Victorian Law Reform Commission. Everyone who knows Hugh knows he's an extraordinarily articulate expert on human rights. But I've always envied Hugh for one thing in particular. Because of Hugh, I'm only the second tallest human rights lawyer in Australia. So um, I, I want to start by trying to humanise this issue a bit. Um, and I'm going to invite uh, Robin first to perhaps tell us a story. It could be either something personal or, or something um, more public that you think shows how human rights uh, have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, thank you, Ed, and it's lovely to be to see you again and to be, you know, with um, all these esteemed colleagues. I, um, as you say, I'm a Wiradjuri person. I am the guest of the Gumbangia people of uh, the mid-north coast of New South Wales, and I pay respects to their uh, elders past, present and emerging, and to their country and to their ancestors. 
the, the um, story that I want to, um, that, that I reflected on um, was really, uh, it took me back to the beginning of this period of COVID and it's kind of COVID related and kind of not. Lots of things have happened in this time. I think this has been a, a momentous time, a momentous time where, have, where we've really had to think about how much do we value life, how much do we value the economy and how are we um, balancing those two. So there are serious issues there. And um, But what, what my mom, I, I just have to go back to the time when the world stopped to watch a police officer in the United States spend eight minutes and 45 seconds deciding not to take his knee off the neck of a dying man who said, I can't breathe, who told him, I can't breathe. And for us as Aboriginal people, we are so familiar. 430 people later after the Royal Commission, still dying in custody. And for the Dungari, the, fa the Dungari family, of Mr. Um, Robert Dungay Jr., who lost their son in, 19, in 2015 with correctional officers on his back as he uttered 12 times, I can't breathe. So that breaks our hearts again. Why I want to talk about it though as well, apart from honouring those people and honouring the advocates for them, is thousands of people took to the street. Our uncles, our brothers, our cousins, our bosses, our, you know, the people who deliver our, you know, takeaway food, thousands of people took to the street here in Australia in the beginning of a pandemic, in the beginning of a pandemic and said no. People took to the street, our, our, our neighbours, Aboriginal people, non-Aboriginal, took to the street and said no. And I think about, I reflect on Rosalind's comment, opening comments about rights becoming a, a, an increasingly um, common discourse again. And I think that was an incredible example, a really moving example for me because we lose hope in this country about these things. I, I know I'm probably talking, I want to just say, in that, in that, that tension between lives and livelihoods, we know there are no livelihoods without lives. And it was a great affirmation of the importance of life and of dignity and respect and for us, us as Aboriginal people there's no livelihood without life and there's no life or livelihood without country and caring for it so for me it really brought the issues of Aboriginal people and our place in this country and the um, tensions to the fore in an amazingly powerful way thanks thank you Robin um, that that expression you just used, that there's no livelihood without life. Um, that might be sort of um, a mantra that Michael Kidd, you and your colleagues have um, had to kind of reflect on. Um, is there a particular story that you think shows how human rights are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Thanks, Ed. You know, I think that all our lives have, have been dramatically affected uh, throughout this year. And I was thinking about how border closures have prevented us from being with people that we love uh, throughout the year, how uh, our ability to move around and leave our own homes uh, at times has, has been impacted, uh, and uh, how uh, the health and well-being of so many people has been impacted. And of course, tragically, we have families right across Australia who have lost loved ones. Uh, to COVID-19 and of course especially we've seen the impact on residential uh, aged care facilities uh, throughout our country and so much of what we've been doing within the Department of Health uh, with the Australian Government has been about protecting the health of the people uh, of Australia and doing everything that we can but it affects all of us and I was thinking about the last time I saw my mum, who's in residential aged care in Melbourne, which was the end of February, I went down for a visit and um, as I left, I was feeling incredibly concerned that maybe this was the last time I get to see my mum as this pandemic was sweeping across the world and we were seeing what was happening in, in Italy and, and other countries around the world. But uh, the measures which have been put in place have been there to try and protect people 
like my mum, uh, with the restrictions uh, on visitation uh, in residential aged care, the, uh, the training uh, of, of the workforce, uh, which has happened, the amazing work that so many people have been doing, the personal care attendants, the nurses and others, uh, to protect these incredibly vulnerable people uh, in our community. Uh, but throughout uh, the pandemic, where I've been based in Canberra and my mum in aged care in Melbourne, of course, I've shared the agony of everyone who's had a loved one in aged care as we've seen what's been happening. But tomorrow, I'm getting on a plane and going down to Melbourne for the first time since February uh, to be re reunited with a mask uh, with my mum. That's wonderful news, Michael. Um, Sarah, would you like to share a story? Uh, yeah, I will. And I look, it really dovetails with what Michael just said, because I've been reflecting on how across the world governments have been forced into some really wicked choices. And the, you know, the, clo the, the stoppage of visitation rights in aged care is a classic example of that. Um, I'm in Queensland, and so uh, the situation in Queensland has been, um, you know, reasonably good, I'll, you know, um, vis-a-vis -vis COVID for a lot of the year, but there was, um, you know, a uh, um, an introduction of, of new cases in the in the state in August, and immediately the government did, um, I think, uh, almost completely shut down aged care. Now that's for an obvious reason; it's to make sure that um, the virus does not get into what's clearly been, you know, the most vulnerable circumstance. But um, and and so you know. I'm not advocating against that, but we also have to remember the human cost of doing that, the human cost of the people that cannot visit their loved ones, but also those loved ones, um, some of whom, um, you know, did not quite understand why they suddenly weren't getting visitors, why their, why their families in other states are, are not in touch with them. Um, but, you know, that's a wicked choice. I'm not going to sit here and say that's a breach of human rights. It's trying to save lives, but there are, you know, you know, some some pretty terrible stories on the other side. What I can add to that though, is that I think, um, and again, I'll only talk about Queensland, there are some aged care homes, which uh, none of them are locked down, but there are still restricted visiting rights. And I hope that that is necessary. I certainly hope they're not being introduced because that makes them easier to run. So I'll just add that. That's a really important principle because there's a huge difference between a necessary restriction on human rights and one that might be um, convenient for some other reason. And it's the necessity, necessity criterion is the one that um, is the only one that we should be focused on. Um, Hugh, uh, can you give us a reflection? You, you're, you're coming to us from Victoria where obviously you've had a very significant period of, um, of, of lockdown most recently. And today's a good day in Victoria. 28 days uh, without community transmission, zero active cases, uh, zero new cases, zero deaths and zero mystery cases. So I think that's the quadruple donut or bagel from a public health perspective, as the chief health officer says. Uh, so a real testament to um, the public health measures that have worked to, for the time being, eliminate the virus here. Um, but you know, I spent the start of this year on long service leave in the US and saw an ineffective public health response and saw the chaos and the loss of life and the exacerbation of inequality caused by that very um, failing government response. It wasn't consistently failing across the country. There were, there were good efforts from some governments. Uh, and so when we flew back at the end of June, it was really looking forward to coming back to Australia, to a country where uh, governments had listened to the evidence and um, saved lives through their public health response. And we were then um, put into quarantine at the Ridges Hotel. Um, there's been very um, public failures that have been identified, particularly at that hotel and that we witnessed firsthand uh, and saw, we saw how those failures led to the second wave in Melbourne and the, the loss of life that followed. And for me, one particular moment that stood out was when we were in quarantine, reading about the hard lockdown of the public housing towers, uh, very close to where our hotel was uh, in North Melbourne and Flemington. And for me, it 
highlighted the challenges that governments face in trying to balance uh, protecting public health and protecting life while restricting rights to the le least degree possible, but also the way that uh, the most vulnerable are often hit the hardest by these restrictions. And so that was a, an overwhelming and unnecessary police response to that public health issue. It was uh, a, a late response to the public health issue that residents had been raising for um, some time. Uh, it was a response that I think was discriminatory and that when we were seeing the failures three months after the quarantine program had been set up and witnessing that firsthand, I was just looking at what they were trying to do with no notice, locking down those towers and 3,000 residents and trying to provide health services and welfare support and food and manage exercise. And I thought this is going to be a complete uh, chaotic debacle. And I think you, you've seen that come out and, and the ombudsman's obviously looking at that and gathering that evidence. But for me, it was a moment that highlighted the challenge that governments have, but also how often those restrictions have their biggest impact on the people um, less least able to actually uh, cope with them. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I'm going to ask you perhaps to give us a, a short lesson on um, international human rights law. Um, really short. <laughs> um, so Hugh has told us uh, about how sometimes governments um, have got it wrong in the way in which they've restricted human rights during the pandemic. What does international law tell us about how um, governments can and cannot restrict human rights during a pandemic? So, um, so most human rights um, can be limited um, in, um, in certain circumstances. And I think most human rights can, well, most human rights can be limited for the purposes of protecting public health. Um, and not only that, governments do have, you know, positive obligations to actually, you know, take control and combat and manage um, things in a pandemic. So, um, so uh, states, um, you know, country, that is countries, but also, you know, the Australian states are permitted to limit um, most human rights um, with proportionate restrictions in order to uh, promote public health. And, you know, on balance, probably most of the restrictions in Australia would, would pass the human rights test. Um, I would probably, I think I would agree with Hugh that there are certainly, I mean, I think there have been, um, it's, it's probably not surprising given the, the size of the impact and, you know, the way governments had to react very quickly that I think some mistakes and human rights abuses did occur. I, I think that the, um, the immediate lockdown of the public housing tower that is giving people no notice of effective home detention. I find that hard to, um, to, to classify that as proportionate. Despite, you know, on the other side are obviously public health issues. Um, uh, certain, I mean, there's a lot of aspects to proportionality. Um, one would probably be, you know, was a measure discriminatory? And I think it, it, I'll be very interested to read the Ombudsman's report about that episode, but I, I think an immediate lockdown, I mean, maybe some sort of lockdown was proportionate, but just to come home and be told, you're not leaving for five days, you've just got to stay in your apartment, and you had no notice of that. Um, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, that assumption, I mean, what was that based on? Um, it seems to me an assumption that people would be non-compliant. I doubt that's an assumption that would be made about, um, you know, all members of the community. So the bottom line is that, um, yes, uh, human rights can be restricted for, uh, by proportionate measures to promote public health. Um, and that applies effectively to civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. There are some uh, human rights which are absolute, which can never be limited in any circumstance, um, such as the right to be free from torture and inhuman and degrading treatment, which probably hasn't been so much an issue, but, you know, one example would be, you know, if someone was kind of forced to lock down in their home with someone who's abusing them. And alas, I'm sure that did happen, that, you know, in circumstances, especially if the government knows, they really have to make alternative arrangements for that person. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, I, I think if you boil some of that down, um, three of the key criteria that need to be applied then <clears throat> when you're assessing any human rights restriction is whether it's reasonable, whether it's necessary and whether it's proportionate. 
Um, I might ask this question of you, Robin. Are, are there particular human rights restrictions that you've been concerned about because they perhaps don't comply with one or more of those principles, reasonableness, necessity, or proportionality? Uh, look, I think that we've had to have a, a, a big reaction. We've had to have a very strong reaction. And I, you know, I began talking about when people talk to the streets, and I want to be really clear that the moment for that has you know, absolutely passed. We began to, to know that um, we could not do that kind of, we can't do that kind of thing. We've had to, you know, socially distance, wear masks. We've had to, you know, all work from home. And those things protecting that, uh, protecting life have been incredibly important. I am not, I guess, so concerned about uh, the necessary justifiable or, or reasonable or proportionate responses at this stage. I think what I'm concerned about is the extent to which we have scrutiny and transparency over over those things because we've had, they've had to be done so quickly. And I think, you know, I've, I've come to really value uh, our parliamentary democracy more and more. Perhaps I'm just getting older. But the, 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 the kinds of scrutiny and transparency and accountability that come from that system uh, are really important. And the fast decisions that are made uh, at an executive level without scrutiny, without that kind of um, uh, transparency and accountability can be, can, can give rise to concern uh, for me. I think one of the, you know, I look at the extent to which, uh, not so much to those direct um, uh, impositions of uh, locks, you know, uh, changes of freedom to movement to association uh, that we've seen, but the way those things might be impacting on the already vulnerable groups, but I know we're going to come to that later. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think the point about scrutiny is a really important one, which we'll, we'll also come back to. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Michael Kidd a question, but before I do that, I might just um, remind everyone who's listening in um, that there's a Q&A function. And uh, if you want to ask any questions, um, you can use that in the Q&A um, function. You can just type it in there um, and uh, we'll, we'll start to kind of integrate those questions into um, this discussion. Um, Michael Kidd, uh, you're, as Deputy CMO, um, you uh, right at the, at, at the front line. Um, so uh, unlike some other countries, we have uh, in Australia made compulsory quarantine an important part of how we combat the virus from coming into Australia. Um, can you tell us, um, perhaps we're not asking you as a human rights lawyer because, because you're not, but, but just in broad terms, what is the difference between um, quarantine uh, and detention? Um, and, and do you feel that Australia's quarantine regime complies with um, human rights, at least as, as Sarah articulated them? Thanks, thanks, Ed. So I will reinforce what you just said. I am not a human rights lawyer. I'm a general practitioner working... Uh, on the on the public health uh, response, uh, certainly um, one of the hallmarks of Australia's success in uh, tackling COVID nineteen and protecting our population uh, has been the closure of our borders, our international borders, uh, the restrictions on who comes into Australia, and when uh, people are coming in, and this has mainly been, of course, Australian citizens returning to Australia. Uh, those people are returning and agreeing to go into uh, supervised hotel quarantine uh, for a two-week period. Uh, that two weeks, of course, um, allowing us to pass through the incubation period uh, for um, the COVID-19. And, and this has been an incredibly successful uh, measure. We've had over 100,000 uh, people who've come back uh, to Australia who've gone into uh, hotel quarantine like you and uh, and his family and uh, and we've had very little um, transmission of uh, COVID-19 uh, coming from those people despite uh, quite a significant number of those people um, being uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, on arrival or uh, during their period uh, in quarantine. Uh, of course um, for me from my general practitioner perspective uh, one of the differences is the quarantine is for a fixed period. Uh, it's something that people know they're going to have to uh, go into um, when, uh, when they 
book their ticket to uh, to fly uh, into Australia. So if you like, it's part of the uh, the contract uh, for uh, coming back uh, into the country and crossing uh, the border. Um, but uh, but I might leave it to others to uh, to talk about the uh, the fine distinction. Well, maybe Q, um, you're well placed both as a human rights expert and as someone who's been doing some uh, human rights field work in the quarantine area. Um, what, what what's your view? Um, well, well, I think the f starting point from a human rights perspective is to very clearly recognise the obligations of Australian governments to protect life and health. So. It, it, it would arguably be, I think in my view, it would be a failure, a breach of human rights not to establish some form of quarantine to protect the community against the risk of transmission from people returning from overseas where community transmission is much, much higher than it is in Australia, obviously. We're doing very well uh, for the time being. Um, so some form of quarantine absolutely justified. Uh, the, the question is, from a human rights perspective, as Sarah outlined, you want to do that. You, you want to limit rights in, with the lowest level of restriction to get that job done to protect life and health. So how do you do that? Um, the, the medical evidence is, is, I think, very clear about 14 days being the period. Question is, do you detain people? What facility do you detain people in? Do you allow them to be um, uh, quarantined uh, at home? Uh, and what we saw in Victoria was obviously the failures around infection control, um, but also around welfare. So as soon as you are detaining people, you are accepting responsibility for their welfare. And you're talking, you know, as Michael said, over 100,000 people in Victoria, 20,000 people or so have gone through the system. And you are going to have people with disabilities, people, uh, elderly people, young children, um, people with mental health concerns, survivors of family violence and sexual assault for whom that experience of being locked up may be extremely traumatic. Uh, people with acute me medical concerns in, in Victoria, the hotel quarantine inquiry showed there was uh, at least one suspected suicide very early on in the program. So a hugely challenging logistical exercise for government to set up at the drop of a hat. Um, and uh, But what we saw months later from our personal experience was that there were still failures that hadn't been addressed in Victoria. So for me, from a human rights approach, yes, you need to have quarantine, but you need to do it properly and responsibly. And um, you need to get things like fresh air and exercise and welfare and medical care right. And um, I've been encouraged to see uh, increasingly sophisticated debate around looking at a better approach to risk management. So I think it was um, completely unnecessary to require people coming from New Zealand where there was no quarantine to, sorry, no transmission to quarantine on arrival in Australia um, uh, in a facility, at least allow them to um, quarantine at home. Um, and can you look at ways of using testing to create a system of mixed quarantine at, at, in a facility and at home? So, for example, my understanding of the evidence is most cases of positive of return travellers are being picked up on that day three test. So can you look at particular countries, for example, where there's low community transmission and have some form of um, compliance where after that day three test comes back negative, you allow that person or their family to um, quarantine at home for the rest of the period. And also really open to exploring other forms of electronic monitoring combined with that home quarantine with the consent of the person um, to uh, give that protection to the community around people um, complying with the requirements uh, to stay at home. So there, there's some of the human rights issues uh, for me that come up with the quarantine. But obviously, coming back to your initial question, it's very different from a, a prison environment. Uh, for example, you're in there for a defined period. Sorry, you're in there for 14 days for a public health reason. You're not accused of a crime. You haven't convicted you're not convicted of a crime. It's a very different environment, but you're still detaining people. You're not free to leave. Um, and in our case, you know, with, we, we, we did not leave our rooms for 12 days straight. Um, and, and many people are going through without any fresh air or exercise at all for the entire 14 day period. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned something there that I wanted to pick up on for a question for Sarah. 
um, you, you've talked, I guess, a bit about electronic surveillance. I'll just put the question in a bit of context. Um, to paraphrase Michael, perhaps, um, one of the justifications for quarantine is that you essentially create a controlled environment for a group of people, that is people coming from overseas, who generally speaking are at higher risk of um, having contracted COVID-19. Um, some other countries in particular are using um, quite heavy surveillance techniques to track people and help stop spread uh, the spread of the virus. Um, in a sense, um, that is another kind of mechanism of control. It's a different mechanism of control. We've seen here in, uh, in South Australia, there's a proposal to use facial recognition um, in, um, in, in that connection. Um, Sarah, I, w I wonder if you can reflect a bit about um, some of the kind of existing um, sort of techniques that are being used here in Australia for surveillance, which on the whole are relatively limited. There's of course the COVID safe app, but also the trajectory that we might be on and whether there's anything in particular that we should steer well clear of. Uh, yeah, um, I think, th thanks for the question. I mean, I think the situation in Australia at the moment, which is, you know, really very good with regard to COVID, is, is not one where I think we could justify greater surveillance. Um, the, the, the payoff might be um, people consenting that when they come back, there might be, you know, people consenting to a um, a system of surveillance rather than going to the hotels. I mean, I've reflected um, on the fact that if I had been, if I had to do hotel quarantine, and there has been some question over that in terms of living in Queensland and maybe, you know, at some stage, now the borders are lifting, but perhaps having to do hotel quarantine after going to Victoria, I have reflected that I personally, if I could be offered an alternative such as an ankle bracelet that I would actually and stay at home, I would much prefer that. So an element of choice would make that much, um, much, uh, much more acceptable. But I think uh, there certainly are some very heavy surveillance um, mechanisms being used in other countries, and certainly in other countries which you'd have to say have been actually quite successful in containing COVID. Countries like Vietnam, countries like China, um, even South Korea. Um, I think you can see that, you know, a, a country, it's fortunately not Australia at this point in time, but a country could be forced into, again, some wicked choices. There is a choice of, um, you know, enormous amounts of community spread. There's a choice of extremely heavy lockdown. There might be a choice in the middle there of, okay, we can balance these things if we allow a lot more surveillance. In that situation, I can see many countries and even populations thinking, okay, we'd actually rather go for option three. Um, again, fortunately, I'm not talking about Australia there. I just can't see that we would need to justify more surveillance. The problem um, in choosing the option of um, undermining privacy is that that might be okay for the period of time, for example, if I was in you know, quarantine and, and for the two weeks that I had to stay at home. Um, it might be okay if all data is expunged um, once um, once the you know the pandemic passes. I'm not sure we can trust governments to do that. That's not the trajectory of these sorts of things. I'm not sure that governments have a, a habit of gaining new powers, particularly with regard to privacy and surveillance, and then somehow relinquishing them. Um, it's a quite a different emergency, but you know we could see that with anti-terrorism laws that they've been extraordinary laws that have been adopted in an emergency situation, and they're never repealed. They just grow, and then they sometimes sneak out into other areas of law. Um, I might finish off by saying um, uh, just an experience of um, another country aside from Australia, and that's the experience of Finland. Finland is probably doing as well as any European country at the moment, and has been doing okay. Um, and in fact, um, has fewer deaths than Australia, um, though I'm sure it has a smaller population. Finland has its app, and its app, I gather, was kind of crowdsourced and has been built actually with privacy by design. And that has led to um, a, lot, a much larger uptake of that app than in most Western countries, because in Western countries, we have been very concerned about privacy. Um, uh, you know, we had a massive download in Australia of the COVID safe app when it first came out, and then it stopped. and as is well known, it hasn't you know, been much of a game changer at all. Maybe one reason for that is people are suspicious of using it. I can't say how much the app um, uh, has led to success in Finland, but one might suspect that it has had some impact 
and you know therefore you know Finland has benefited from taking privacy seriously. Yeah that's a really interesting observation um, and um, there's going to be lots of sort of negative stuff that I'm going to come back to but maybe you know, take the positive there which is um, authoritarianism perhaps doesn't work so well <laughs> it's not very human rightsy either um, and in fact taking the community with you does seem to work much better. Um, question for you Robin um, during the pandemic, we've seen Indigenous communities and organisations leading the way in protecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on country um, with, you know, really good, um, although largely unpublicised success from a public health perspective. Um, do, do you think that sets a precedent? Um, what, what do you think we can do um, to learn from this to, um, I guess, improve the way in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are able to exercise autonomy and self-determination. Thanks, Ed. Look, it is, it's, it's a really untold story of unsung heroes out there, of you know, people who acted really fast uh, and they were able to do that. I just want to quickly link it to, um, to uh, what Sarah was saying. People went into lockdown really voluntarily too, and I think that is a really important uh, important thing. Thinking about that, the the the, um, the infringements on human rights around surveillance, and that people did it voluntarily, and they did it because they know, you know, importantly, it's for a period of time. They were able to do it because we have uh, really strong community-controlled health organisations. And we have great people in business as well now and great people, Aboriginal people in business, in government, who are able to come together and say, how are we gonna do this? We, what do we need to do? We need to lock down, we need to secure supply chains, we need to um, tell people they can't come. People just were all over it. And they were able to do it, as I began with, because the community controlled health sector and the health sector for us has a long history of strong evidence-based policy making, really good data collection, thinking through the data you're collecting because we've had you know, a lot, uh, really good discussions uh, and good thinking on not just collecting deficit data, collecting strengths-based data, the issues that uh, Professor Maggie Walters has raised around data sovereignty and other people as well. So looking at how we collect this information so we can bring build strength-based models uh, and they're in a process of continuous improvement. They're, so a really rigorous, strong health sector, uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous health sector and community controlled organisations and great leadership that was able to swing into, into action and move when nobody else was moving. While everybody else was still equivocating, they just went for it because they knew that there was, as, as we know from this, and we know that there's been such urgency, they saw that urgency and they just went. And I love, you know, yeah. that's, it's actually following the direction of the WHO, the, I forget, the Irish fellow yeah. of the WHO said, you've got to go fast. So they went fast. What we know about it is we can do it. We mm. know we can do it. We know we know how to do it. We know we can do it, we, that we can do it, that we've got great relationships, great knowledge, great organisations. And if you let us, sometimes I think, you know, people talk about empowering Indigenous people. I think, you don't need to empower us. Sometimes you just need to step out of the way and we are, we are empowered and we will just do it. We, we know what we need to do and we will do it. Um, but we also want to work in partnership. None of those things could have been done if uh, it wasn't in partnership with government, with, um, with businesses that help secure supply chain and transport. It has to be done in partnership. So um, it's a wonderful example of um, people moving out of the way, letting people, Aboriginal people who know what they're doing and the people who work with them who know what they're doing, go for it, go fast and working in partnership. Thank you, Robin. Um, while we're on good news, um, th this is a question for you, Michael. Uh, we've, we've had some quite um, promising news, at least to my lay ears, about uh, the prospects for vaccinations over the last um, week or so. Um, it sounds like there's at least three sort of separate initiatives at the moment that, that are all um, possibly going to bear fruit. Um, so I, I wonder if you can tell us whether you have any views, um, and it'll just go no further than the um, 214 people on this um, uh, Zoom call, about whether you think uh, vaccination should be compulsory, either at a general, as a general principle, or in particular situations, um, if we do end up with a safe and effective vaccine. 
Thanks, thanks, Ed. And you, you've hit the two important words. If we're going to have a vaccine, it has to be safe and it has to be effective. And so what we've, what we've seen is actually extraordinary developments in health and medical research over the past uh, 10 months. This uh, level of international collaboration, including involving uh, many leading Australian uh, researchers uh, and clinicians has just been extraordinary to get us to the point where we now have this suite of different uh, vaccine uh, approaches um, which can be uh, which are being trialed for use against COVID-19 but it's going to leave a very long-lasting legacy I'm sure um, with new ways of tackling all sorts of terrible communicable diseases in many parts of the world including many diseases uh, which affect uh, uh, people in low-income countries where very little investment uh, has taken place uh, in the past. So if, there, if it can be said there is anything good coming out of the pandemic, I think that some of these extraordinary innovations uh, in, uh, in science and technology are part of it. Um, as, as you've said, we've seen some very encouraging news over the last few weeks with um, three of the vaccine developers. Two of, the, two of them are, are for vaccines that the Australian government has a contract uh, uh, to get uh, uh, access to those vaccines for our population. And also we're, we're over ordering, so there may be a uh, uh, vaccine also for uh, our new neighbours uh, as well. And, uh, and the, the question everyone is asking, of course, is what's the time frame? Uh, when is it going to be available? Who is, who is going to be at the top of the, uh, the list? Uh, the National Cabinet released the uh, National COVID-19 Vaccine uh, Policy uh, at its last meeting a couple of weeks ago, which talks about uh, immunising uh, those people who are most at risk, which of course uh, in Australia is, is the elderly who uh, are impacted and more likely to die if they contract COVID-19, people with uh, chronic uh, health uh, conditions, people with immune compromised, but also the people who are providing care to those people, our healthcare workforce, our aged care workforce, our personal care uh, attendants who are providing home care uh, to elderly people and people with disability. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, we have to have a vaccine first, which meets the uh, safety standards of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. And, uh, and we have to have vaccines, if we're going to be immunising elderly people, we have to have had the research to show us that the vaccine is actually going to be effective and long lasting in elderly people. So the trials at the moment uh, are very early because what we don't know is how long the immune response which is generated will last for. Uh, what we do know is that most of the vaccines are going to require two uh, doses and you'll need two doses of the same vaccine. And this means we are going to have to do some very sophisticated monitoring of who gets what vaccine when and following up to make sure that people get the second dose uh, so that they're protected. Final thing is, of course, we've seen recent annou announcements about maybe not being able to fly internationally unless you have uh, received the vaccine, uh, which uh, raises some interesting questions as well. Raises some interesting questions, indeed, it does. Um, does, uh, does anyone want to have a swing at answering any of those questions? To, um, in particular, I guess, uh, Sarah or Robin or Hugh? Um, I've been doing quite a lot of searching because look, I think the, I mean, the vaccine, uh, I've, I've been a vaccine optimist all year and I think there's even more reason to be a vaccine optimist now. Um, I. Uh, I mean, the issue, I'm, I'm fascinated by the issue that a vaccine would be mandatory. Um, we might be getting a bit sidetracked here because for a little, for a while, um, demand's probably going to outstrip supply anyway. So um, the issue of, you know, forcing someone to take it who doesn't want it might not be so viable. Um, but then there is the issue, um, and that gets, of course, into human rights in the private sphere, you know, is it a breach um, you know, should the government stop Qantas from insisting that people have the vaccine? Um, I suspect that the strict legal answer to that might be that, you know, maybe that Qantas is entitled to demand that. Um, I say that, and I'm going to get very legal here, I, I'm surprised at how little there is in the case law, and maybe, maybe Hugh can correct me, but how little there is in the case law, and I'm talking about international case law and case law from other countries, um, Australia doesn't have so much human rights law, so it hasn't arisen here in the human rights context so much. But there's not a lot out there about actual mandatory vaccination. Um, and what is out there, there's actually quite a lot of exemptions. And in some cases, 
exemptions for conscientious objection. Someone who's simply, you know, you probably have to have to prove that there is a real conscience point of view rather than just pure anti-vax skepticism, but it may not be that hard. So it's, it's a question that I think will be answered. Like I think COVID, the, uh, the COVID vaccine is going to force human rights lawyers to deal with this issue, which I don't find black and white because, you know, if we have a super effective vaccine, then it might be fine because we can um, vaccinate ourselves. And, you know, the, the, the idea of sitting next to someone else who's not vaccinated may not matter so much. And we are hearing from some, you know, from some of the companies that this is 90% effective, this is 95. My understanding, um, not being um, a medically trained person, is that that would be extraordinary if that's how it actually plays out in the real world, as opposed to a controlled, um, a controlled study. Um, so ironically, the less effective it is, and I, I mean, I'd be keen on, um, on Michael's view, like when we say it's safe, well, I think we know what safety means. What do we mean by effective? I mean, effective, I think is probably 60 or 70% effective. That's around the effectiveness of the flu vaccine. Um, ironically, though, the less effective it is, the more we need everyone to take it, and the more rational it is not to take it. <laughs> so there's some, there's, I, I, there's some really interesting questions there, which we are going to be forced to confront. I want to switch gears um, in a moment, but I'll just give Michael a quick chance to respond to that question about efficacy. Yes, look, I think that a lot of this we're going to find out once the vaccines start getting released into the uh, public domain and when we do the post-marketing surveillance uh, on populations which have been uh, vaccinated uh, both in Australia but also uh, around the world uh, to see how effective it is. And as you rightly say, Sarah, not everyone who gets the influenza vaccine each year uh, generates a response which actually is protective uh, for that person. But we get the protection through large numbers of people being immunised. Um, Hugh, I want to ask you a question now. Uh, we at the Commission, and, and I know you and your colleagues at the Human Rights Law Centre as well, have expressed particular concern about the risk of COVID-19 for people who are deprived of their liberty. They could be deprived of their liberty in prison, um, in our jurisdiction, in immigration detention and, and elsewhere. Um, how do you think that Australian governments should treat those people during the pandemic? Thanks, Ed. And I might just rewind to the vaccine question. Um, just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult one. It's, it's great news from a human rights perspective that we have a vaccine and that the Australian government is um, working really hard to make that vaccine uh, available to people in Australia. And obviously, as Michael said, we want to focus on those most at risk. Um, we, we also want to tread really carefully about looking at things like that Qantas requirement and, you know, the suggestion that it become um, mandatory. And I think the Prime Minister quickly retracted that suggestion. Um, I, I don't have an easy answer to those questions like Sarah, um, like Sarah identified, but we do need to make sure that if there are medical reasons why someone is more at risk, from taking that vaccine that we create exemptions, that we look at what is the least restrictive response to achieve that public health outcome. If people have genuine religious or conscientious objections, that we look at how we might be able to accommodate those within whatever framework there is around the rollout of that vaccine or individual businesses um, making decisions about offering goods and services or not offering goods and services, depending on pe whether people get tested, because the Victorian government has said you have to get tested now before you fly back. Um, obviously, the test is is less intrusive than a, a needle with a vaccine, which I assume is how it's going to be administered. Um, so we need to tread carefully. We need to think about exemptions, think about the genuine reasons why people might not uh, want to have a vaccine, either from a medical or religious or conscientious point of view, and, and, and adopt a framework accordingly and work really carefully looking at all the legal, ethical and medical issues to come up with a consistent framework around this, because... Uh, I think when we look at the existing legal frameworks, there there there, there are gaps, and and like yeah, Sarah, I, I think there's not a lot of case law around this that I have seen. In terms of closed environments, obviously, we know from the what happened in cruise ships that um, as soon as you have people packed into one area, like in a quarantine hotel, for example, um, you create risks of transmission between 
uh, people who are held and between um, the people who are um, either supervising them, guarding them or providing services to them. And so there are really acute risks around um, prisons and immigration detention. Uh, that need to be managed uh, very carefully. And we've seen governments around the world um, in um, you know, comparative liberal democracies working very hard to reduce numbers in prison, either by in, in a very safe and responsible way, I should emphasize, by looking at um, low risk prisoners who can be released, looking at a, a, a better risk assessment around bail, and whether people need to be on pre-trial detention and then um, in immigration detention context looking at um, the uh, a, a greater ability for people to be released into community detention so that they could or community housing so that they can safely isolate and so we've been really disappointed by the response in Australia, both in prisons and in immigration detention. Uh, you know, even before the pandemic, uh, there are hundreds of uh, uh, people uh, who should not be in immigration detention, who there is no legitimate uh, reason for them to be detained. When you overlay a pandemic and the acute risks of um, COVID spreading within an immigration detention context, the uh, the need to um, release people from immigration detention becomes more acute. Um, we're very fortunate that we have avoided those risks um, so far, um, but that doesn't mean we um, should be complacent. And from our point of view, the, the government should be doing a lot more, both at the state and um, territory and federal level when it comes to immigration detention to be better managing those risks. Thanks, Hugh. Um, I, I want to ask a big question now because a big theme really of a number of the comments that, that um, you've all been making has been that um, we need to get these measures right. They have to um, address the public health uh, crisis, but they must be targeted. So they mustn't be disproportionate, they mustn't be unreasonable or unnecessary. Um, and sometimes, as, as Hugh and others have pointed out, it seems that our government gets it wrong. Um, so what, uh, we'll start with the, the, the reality of the situation. What happens when um, someone feels that the government has got it wrong, or a corporation for that matter? What can they do? Um, Sarah, with your lawyer's hat on, I might ask you that question first. Um, well, they can, uh, I mean, you know, yeah, we do have a lack of human rights law generally in Australia. I mean, in the jurisdictions of Victoria and Queensland, there is um, some opportunity to challenge certain measures. We had a challenge, there was a challenge which went forward regarding the curfew in Victoria. Um, it failed, but it, you know, th that was a measure of scrutiny and accountability. Um, I also do wonder whether the charter um, or charter considerations were somehow, I mean, we may never know, but were somehow influential in Victoria, you know, suddenly dropping the curfew. Once the curfew came under a lot of media scrutiny and so on, it, it, it disappeared pretty quickly, um, even though the later legal challenge was lost. But um, uh, at the federal level, um, we don't, you know, have a lot of human rights law. So, you know, there are probably are judicial review mechanisms and other mechanisms for challenging certain executive decisions. I mean, having said that, most of the coercive measures have come from the states. Um, uh, I've, I've never known in my life the states to be as prominent as they have been this year in our federation. Um, so, um, so, you know, when it comes to human rights remedies, um, Australia is generally lacking. Uh, there, are, there are potential remedies available in the three jurisdictions which have human rights acts. ACT, Victoria, Queensland, um, and, um, and, you know, and then there are other situations. There may be anti-discrimination claims, and, you know, depending on, you know, things that, have, things that may have happened in certain situations. But, um, you know, we don't have in this country the same legal mechanisms for, chal for challenging uh, government decisions on human rights grounds that exist in um, many other countries, and certainly amongst our liberal democratic peers. I think that's a Fantastic overview. Um, so I might actually come back to you, Hugh. Um, so if you had a client um, who felt that their human rights were being violated under Victorian law, what would be your advice? And then what if it were a, a federal measure? Um, how would your advice be different? What could they, what could they actually do practically? So 
yeah, we, we, we have um, charters of human rights only in Victoria, Queensland and the ACT at the moment in Australia. Our organisation is obviously working to change that. We have a campaign for an Australian Charter of Human Rights and uh, that is an Australian Charter of Human Rights would give people the power to take action to in courts to protect their human rights. But um, the beauty of charters of rights is the preventative role that they play. So working effectively, a charter of rights will have its greatest impact when a government is looking at something like compulsory vaccination or border closures or curfews or quarantine and say, how do we um, get this right in terms of a human rights um, compliant system or policy or law? And uh, it's, it's a very simple but powerful test to apply, which is, are we limiting rights in doing this? If we are, what is the, um, do we have a good reason for it? Is it justified? And is there a way of achieving that goal in a least, less restrictive way on human rights? And that test can be applied to any of the issues that we've talked about today. And the process of going through that test honestly um, and with integrity is one that will deliver much better services and outcomes to the people in Australia. Um, governments will not take that test seriously and those obligations seriously unless there is some kind of enforcement mechanism. So rights without remedies aren't rights at all. And so it's absolutely critical that people have the power to challenge decisions or policies that affect them if they think their human rights have been breached. And we've seen that quite effectively. Queensland has a, an ability to complain uh, to the Queensland Human Rights Commission. And we've seen the commission intervening, for example, in cases where quarantine was having a particular impact on people with a disability and were able to help those that family to negotiate an exemption and those people were able to safely uh, quarantine at home. And that, that's the system working as it should. Ideally, that, that would have happened proactively, but the, that complaint mechanism, it was resolved. There was no litigation or anything like that. Um, the curfew case was a really important case. We had very um, uh, um, unhelpful and um, statements, public statements from both the Premier, the, the Chief Health Officer and the Commissioner of Police about the justification for the curfew in Victoria. And that for me led to real doubts about the public health justification for the curfew. And uh, someone who ran a business challenged that curfew using the charter. Um, as Sarah said, that provided really important scrutiny of that decision-making process. And ultimately the court was satisfied that despite those public statements where, where the chief health officer said, I didn't ask for the curfew, the police said, um, we didn't ask for it. Um, so what was the justification internally in government The court was satisfied that there was a strong public health, a strong enough public health justification for that curfew and no contrary evidence around public health grounds showing that you didn't need the curfew was introduced in that court case. And so um, that, that's just one example of the power of a charter to provide that scrutiny and a means to test this. And, um, and when, when you have that, governments will take, take their obligation seriously and working effectively, that will all happen at the early preventative stage rather than um, when problems arise down the track. So what do you do if you're in a jurisdiction that's not Victoria, Queensland or the ACT or your complaint is with the federal government? Well, you, you do what um, someone did challenging the travel ban, leaving, leaving the country. So we, we've had an extraordinary situation in Australia where you can't leave without permission. Um, no other country in the world has that. Um, uh, and, and it is extraordinarily hard to see the justification for that. And uh, I think we had a situation where Dutch citizens were trying to leave the country uh, to live and return home, but had to apply for permission and were being uh, uh, strung out for months to get that permission. Uh, and often um, ha had very little support and, and you know, trying to um, face all the stress and pressure of winding up their lives here and moving back. And so someone challenged that um, ban in the federal court and without a Charter of Rights, there was no test to say, is this a justified ban? 
Is it the least restrictive means to achieve that public health outcome? Of course, there, there, there are public health grounds because the government was worried people would leave and then come back and put pressure on the quarantine system. So I understand the argument for it, um, but uh, it, it was it, it's hard to justify, I think, and that justification didn't need to be done in that court case because there is no federal federal charter of human rights. And so it was a court case that was argued on pure judicial review administrative law grounds, um, which for the administrative lawyers out there, we all know that uh, it is very uh, governments and there are very limited grounds on which you can using traditional administrative law um, uh, remedies. Thank you. So, I mean, this has been a big question that's um, been coming up in the q and I've been integrating questions as we go and protecting people's privacy um, by not calling out the names of questioners. But, but if I can just sort of summarise what I think um, has been said, if you, if you live in a jurisdiction, um, uh, particularly Victoria, Queensland or the ACT, which has a Human Rights Act or Charter, um, and you have a complaint, you can take that complaint to your state or territory Human Rights Commission. Um, and hopefully that can be um, resolved, ultimately can be taken um, to court um, if necessary. Um, and you can argue your case on human rights grounds. In the other jurisdictions and um, federally, um, it's not quite um, so simple. Uh, for us here um, as the National Human Rights Commission, um, you can complain to us if you believe that uh, the federal government is um, acting inconsistently with um, its human rights obligations, um, but we don't sit as a court. We can't issue a determination that, that forces the government to change course, um, and, um, and, and that matter can't be ventilated in the same way um, through the courts. So I, I think Hugh makes a very powerful point that um, we're missing something really important in our legal architecture. Um, that, that, that would enable people to resolve some of those disputes. Um, but I want to come back to something that um, I think Michael said earlier on, which is that some of these disputes really come down to very difficult policy questions. I think the, the term that um, one of the speakers used was that these are wicked choices. Um, you, Michael, have a seat at the table for when some of those wicked choices have to be met, or made, I should say. Um, what do you think um, would be most helpful for people making sure that those human rights considerations uh, that come to the fore when those big policy decisions are made? Thanks, Ed. That's a, that's a huge question. Obviously, the, the public health decisions which are being made through the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, which I sit on with uh, the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Health Officers of each of the states and territories and, and others. Uh, the decisions are being made based on the evidence, the evidence base that we have of what is going to protect uh, the public. Now, of course, the evidence base on tackling COVID-19 is, uh, is, is growing, but uh, early in the uh, pandemic, there was not a lot of evidence because we had not had a similar uh, pandemic for a century uh, to, uh, to, to build on. One of the uh, initiatives very early on was uh, Minister Greg Hunt established the National COVID-19 Health and Research Advisory Committee to, uh, to, to scope the evidence from across the world and to try and provide um, uh, answers to some of these questions. And the, the committee included people with expertise in ethics. Uh, because you'll remember very early on in the pandemic, some of the most challenging uh, problems being faced in places like uh, Italy was the rationing of uh, healthcare services. Who got admitted to hospital and who didn't? Who got admitted to intensive care and who didn't? Who got put onto a ventilator and who didn't? So in effect, who lived uh, and who died? And uh, terrible challenges, of course, you know, our policy again was to try and prevent that scenario from occurring in Australia by all the public health measures to flatten the curve and at the same time boosting the, the capacity in, in our healthcare system. But uh, and uh, you know it's uh, it's it's challenging to to, to balance uh, some of these ethical issues, some of the human rights issues, uh, with the uh, the approach that we have. Thanks, Michael. Um, one of the questions um, that's coming from uh, the community who are listening is directed to you, Robin. 
Um, you talked, I think, very powerfully at the start about um, people protesting in the streets about long-standing injustice. Um, with uh, the, the, the ability to engage in those sort of protests um, curtailed in some ways um, at the moment. Um, what do you think people should be doing in order to make a difference beyond exercising their right to protest? Thank you. I think it's a really it's a really good question. I think there are lots of advocacy uh, options for people in writing, writing to me, you know, contacting the, for example, in relation to Black Lives Matter, contacting advocacy organisations, contacting legal uh, Aboriginal legal services, offering to help, offering to to write, to um, participate in the in what's been a campaign since before the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Uh, you know, it's been a, a long-standing campaign. So there are uh, lots of community-controlled organisations like Legal Services that will uh, have campaigns and offer ways ways to contribute. Thanks, Robin. Um, I'm I'm just uh, sort of circling through some of the um, the, the questions that are coming in. Uh, th there was a kind of a follow up question that's coming from a couple of people about the, um, the the idea of no jab, no service. So it was it was um, I guess put forward first by one of the major airlines, but it but it could increasingly be something that um, other companies put forward as well. Um, Sarah, from your human rights experience, do do you think that there is um, some justification for having um, that sort of policy? Yeah, look, as I said, I look, I, I struggle um, to to work out the kind of human rights answer regarding, um, you know, the, the, a compulsory jab. Um, as Hugh said, the, I mean, the, the government, the, the Australian government has announced that it's not going to make it compulsory. Um, and, and look, from a general point of view, that's probably not even going to be an issue for quite some time because, as I said, demand is going to outstrip supply. Um, and, and just as an aside, one human rights issue regarding the vaccine that we haven't mentioned is access, that the government will have obligations to get it out to those who want it, um, which is going to be most of the people. And that includes, you know, the most remote communities and so on. And that will be um, logistically difficult with, with some of the vaccines, which, you know, have to be stored at very, very low temperatures and so on. Um, going back, so look, but there will be, I think, uh, some really fraught questions around international travel. Um, it may, I mean, it may be, a, look, Qantas's hands might, might be tied in the end anyway, because I do think there's a possible chance the Australian government will make it compulsory to have a vaccine to enter the country. Um, and uh, that, that um, from a human rights point of view, may not raise that many issues with regard to non-nationals, would raise issues with regard to nationals and certainly residents, people trying to return home. But uh, look, I, the government hasn't announced anything like that, but uh, there are precedents for that. There are a lot of countries in the world where you have to have a yellow, a yellow fever vaccine. So that could, um, in the end, may take the question out of Qantas's hands. Um, I guess there also may be choice. I don't know what the, you know, I, I haven't heard that any other airline has yet announced this. Um, and so, and I, I, I probably, I'm, I'm not sure every, every airline will. I think there could be a fraught issue with, with regard to universities and universities, which in many ways are also emanations of the state. And so, um, you know, I'm not really sure what universities are going to do with regard to the, um, to the vaccine and what we're going to require of international students and even um, just students on campus. Uh, look, as I said, it's, it's uh, I mean, on the one side, uh, I, I think, you know, for your own personal health, if you don't want to take a vaccine and you're willing to take the risk, that's, that's fine, you know, from a human rights point of view, I think, yes, you've got your personal autonomy. The problem with the vaccine is, um, is that it's not just about you, and, and in fact, this is a it, it's a this is a it, it's a mini encapsulation of the whole COVID issue. It's not just about you. The reason we had lockdown is not necessarily to stop you from getting COVID. It's to stop you from getting COVID and spreading it to other people. So, um, so we've had to understand from the start that human rights is not just about one person's rights. It's about everybody's rights, and that is an issue with regard to the vaccine as well. I think. I think. The human rights answer will become a lot clearer once we know a lot more about the safety and the efficacy of whatever we end up using. Sounds like in Australia, we'll end up using perhaps a number of different vaccines. 
but um, I I can't nail my colours to the mast yet on this issue, and um, I'm, because it's it's really fraught. I personally do find it difficult to to think that of companies telling everyone of you know look you have to have this jab that really is quite intrusive, but the consequences on the other side for um, other people. And again, it depends on the efficacy. If it's extreme, you know, if we get not, if we actually do get 90%, strangely enough, that actually reduces, in my view, the argument that people have to get vaccinated because those who do are generally pretty safe anyway. But I think... Yeah, so go, go ahead. Uh, well, as I said before, I think um, 90, you know, from my understanding, actual 90% effectiveness would be quite extraordinary if that plays out in the real world. There's something that Sarah um, alluded to just now, Michael, that I want to put to you. Um, when, when she says it's not necessarily all about the individual who's making the choice about whether to get the jab for their own physical health, it, it's, it's about the community as a whole. Um, and and um, what that also raises is a theme that's come through the questions, which is the, the balance between physical health and, and um, mental health. Um, particularly when it comes to lockdowns. So some people have said, well, look, frankly, you know, at my age and stage, I'm less worried about contracting COVID-19 than I am about being subjected to a long lockdown, which, which could really affect my mental health. Um, how have you, um, in, in your role, sought to um, strike those sorts of balances as uh, appropriately as possible? Well, certainly right from the beginning of, of the pandemic when we were developing uh, the principles behind our, our national primary care response. And we were, it was based on principles of protecting the vulnerable, making sure that we had the capacity to continue regular health services for everybody, making sure that we we're protecting our healthcare uh, workforce, making sure that we had ways of segregating those who might have COVID from those who didn't, so healthcare services could continue. But also there was a real concern about making sure that we addressed the mental health uh, impacts uh, of the pandemic. We could see, again, what was happening in, in other parts of the world. And of course, that has rolled out uh, in Australia as well. The Australian government has made huge investments in supporting uh, mental health through uh, support for uh, the many agencies which provide uh, support and advice through the telehealth uh, provisions, which we've all got used to, being able to connect with our GP or our mental health therapist uh, remotely using telehealth rather than face-to-face, uh, -face, but uh, continuing concern about uh, whether there will be a, a, a tale of, um, of, of, uh, of, of harm or impact uh, on the mental health of individuals uh, as a result of what's been happening uh, throughout the pandemic. And of course, uh, the, the, the direct impacts of, of uh, living uh, with the anxiety and the fear and the worry that we've all had and the impacts of the isolation. One of the areas that we're very concerned about, the Aged Care Royal Commission uh, picked this up in their COVID-19 special report, uh, is the mental and emotional health impacts on elderly people in residential aged care uh, who have been separated from their loved ones, uh, especially in the case of people in Melbourne, now for many, many months. Uh, and the need to boost uh, providing services and support uh, to, uh, to those people. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to ask you all to comment on one last question, um, starting with you, Robin. You, you um, a few minutes ago, talked about some of the positive lessons that we can um, derive, um, at least for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities from um, the experience of the pandemic. Um, and we often hear, you know, mantras like build back better. Um, and it, I guess it suggests that out of this crisis, we can become a better country. So we don't want to be Pollyanna, but we do want to learn something from this experience. Um, do, do you have one, do you, each of you have one suggestion of something we've learned from this crisis that we can take forward and, and, and we can um, use to improve our community going forward, starting with you, Robert? Oh gosh, um, it's a it's it's sorry asking me for one is <laughs> I'm never very good at that kind of thing. I think about um, that we've been all asked 
to think about not just ourselves, but the collective good. I think that's been a really important conversation for this country to have. I think we need to think about what kind of economy we want on the other side of this. We haven't talked about that much. I think the stimulus measures have been fantastic. I think we need to think about who's going to drive this economy. Hopefully it won't be built on, you know, opening the floodgates for individual consumers to um, borrow more than they can bear. I think we really have to think about um, protecting the human rights we have, protecting the consumer rights that we have, and building an economy that is kind, that is kind, that is fair, that thinks about our collective good. And for the moment, we absolutely have to think about the fact that we need this planet to live on. And Aboriginal knowledge about how to care for country, how to, to bring values of reciprocity and care to business are something that this country can really learn from, how to look after this place and how to look after ourselves in a, in a the strong economy in a way that has reciprocity, looks after the most vulnerable. And there's a lot to learn from, from Aboriginal um, uh, people, Aboriginal cultures, Aboriginal knowledges. And I think this focus that we've had to have on what is the collective good has been good for us. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Hugh, um, one positive idea arising from the pandemic? Uh, I've, I've got a few, but I'll be brief. Uh, I, I think we've seen uh, some of, uh, in this pandemic, we've seen Australian governments at times acting fantastically, like the, the best of politics and the best of government action. And we've seen that uh, with motivation and resources, you can get really good outcomes for the community through job seeking. Just to, uh, job seeker and job keeper so that people can live a dignified life, uh, free childcare, getting people out of homelessness, like an enormous effort that has been a real success. We shouldn't uh, say goodbye to those efforts just because the pandemic has gone. It show, it's shown what we can achieve um, when we put human rights um, in focus when we care about people. I think, um, you know, what Sarah and Robin said about the, the pandemic showing that we're all connected as human beings and human rights provides a way of building on that connectiveness to build the kind of society that we all want with fairness and compassion and respect and dignity at its heart. And um, we would love to see out of this momentum for greater momentum for an Australian Charter of Rights to fill those gaps at the national level around human rights protection. Thanks, Hugh. Um, Sarah. Uh, look, um, building on the previous speakers, I think, um, look, I think Australia's success, you know, as we sit here now on this date with containing COVID is, has been a tribute to um, our willingness to, to um, you know, make sacrifices for everybody else. I mean, we've had very harsh measures in certain places, particularly Melbourne. And my understanding of that is people didn't enjoy them, but people by and large supported them and complied with them. And so that, you know, shows us as a community what we're capable of. I mean, if you look at the, what the debate is in the United States right now, it's, you know, people are, you know, still, you know, overly concerned with their own freedom. I mean, they're so concerned with their freedom, they're dying of their freedom. And um, whereas in Australia, we were willing. And I, I think, you know, there was a certain, certain disrespect of people in Melbourne when at times the fines and the police action were emphasised. I sort of thought, well, actually, people are complying. And so, you know, that, that, that's indicating that they're not, which I think was disrespectful. So I think to kind of build on that spirit would be great. And look, sorry, one more. I think it also, the pandemic has shown that a fairer society is more resilient in, con in, in yeah. combating a pandemic. Um, we've seen that the most vulnerable people are the people in insecure work, uh, during lockdown, who are the people who are continuing to go to work? Some of the most lowly, some of the, you know, who do we need the most? Ended up being some of the most lowest paid workers in our society. Um, and we've seen, you know, fault lines in, you know, in aged care and so on. Why was it that uh, the for-profit aged care sector did so much worse than the state-run aged care sector, you know, in Victoria? So these are all things, fair, you know, just build on the knowledge. We've, we've probably always known, but a fairer society deals with it, you know, would, would, would deal with future pandemics um, better. And sorry, quickly to build on what Robin said, unfortunately, we probably have to anticipate future pandemics unless we get our environment under control. Indeed. Um, I'm going to give the final word on this to the good doctor, uh, Michael. <laughs> 
Uh, thanks, Ed. Look, I, the thing which has heartened me most has been the sense of community that we've seen right across Australia. Um, people really stepping up to look after each other and not just to look after their own families, but look after their neighbours and, and look after others. It's been extraordinary. And especially in, in the healthcare sector. One of the, the principles of global health is about how do we make our healthcare systems more people-centred and more people-focused rather than system are focused and I think we've seen that with the great adaptations we've seen in our healthcare system particularly with the example of, of telehealth we we transformed the way we delivered healthcare in 10 days to ensure that the people of Australia could still get access to health as a fundamental uh, human right so I want to finish by just paying my respects to all those frontline workers, our healthcare workers, our aged care workers, our Aboriginal health workers, our emergency workers, our ambulance uh, officers, everyone across uh, the system who's, who have just behaved magnificently, So as we would have expected people to behave. But uh, I think, again, that, uh, that respect for all those people on the front line is uh, something I hope will be enduring as well. That's a wonderful way to wrap up. Um, it just falls to me to thank a number of people. First, my colleague, um, the President of the Human Rights Commission, Professor Rosalind Croucher, um, Greg Dickerson, who heads uh, LexisNexis in Australia, um, and then our four wonderful panellists. Uh, so Professor Robin Quiggan, Professor Sarah Joseph, Professor Michael Kidd, and for today at least, Honorary Professor Hugh de Kretzer. Um, thank you all very, very much for sharing your deep expertise and being um, uh, willing to kind of work with us, um, not just on, on glib one-liners, but to, to really help understand some of the nuance of getting the balance right in protecting human rights in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for everyone who contributed questions, thank you also for actively participating. I'm really pleased that we were able to cover one way or another many of the questions that were asked. And uh, I thank you on behalf of the Australian Human Rights Commission for listening to this presentation.